So here I will explain nucleophilic substitution as both SN1 and SN2 mechanisms and then I'll also talk about the differences. So here we have a halogen alkane, more specifically bromoethane, which is being attacked by a nucleophile, which is the hydroxyl group over here. Now what is a nucleophile? A nucleophile is any reactant which has a lone pair of electrons. Now why is this hydroxyl group a nucleophile? Let me just show you the structure. You can see oxygen here has quite a few lone pair of electrons. So it has three lone pair of electrons which it can donate. So it's a very strong nucleophile. So here, this nucleophile attacks the primary carbon over here. The primary carbon is attached to the halogen group. And this nucleophile, it actually donates its lone pair to the carbon over here and it forms a new covalent bond. At the same time that COH bond forms this new covalent bond, the carbon halogen bond breaks down. So this is the intermediate product. And the carbon hydrogen bond breaks down heterolytically. This can be called as hydrolytic fission as well. The reason why this is hydrolytic is that because bromine atom over here takes away the extra electron which is shared between carbon and bromine. That's why this is left with a negative sign because this has an extra electron. And then the extra electron which carbon lost, you can say it this way, this is actually donated by the nucleophile. So this way, we, we get a neutral molecule over here. Now this is SN2 substitution. The S comes from substitution, the N comes from nucleophile, and 2 comes from the fact that, that this is a bimolecular rate equation. So the rate of the reaction depends on both the halogen alkane as well as the nucleophile over here. Now we come to SN1 substitution. Here we have a tertiary halogen alkane. And the reason why I'll tell you this is a tertiary hydrogen alkane is because this carbon over here, it is attached to three more carbons. This structure over here would become a secondary carbocation because this is connected to, car to two carbons. This over here is attached, attached to three carbons and this one over here is attached to only one carbon. So, and the other side could be hydrogen or a halogen over here. So this would be a primary carbocation. So this is a tertiary halogen alkane. And we can see that this bond over here, it's polar. This is polar because bromine is quite electronegative. So one pair of electrons is shared between carbon and bromine. And since bromine is quite electronegative, this pulls away some of the electron towards itself. You can see this arrow represents here pulling away. And then this has a slight negative charge. And this carbon over here has a slight positive charge. So this bond somehow breaks down heterolytically. Again, heterolytically, which means that bro heterolytically, this means that bromine takes the electron pair, which was shared between carbon and itself. And then you form a carbocation. A carbocation has a positive charge, which means it just lacks electrons. And then this way, this so this broke, breaking down process is quite slow. It's a little bit slow. And then after it breaks down into a carbocation and the halogen ion over here, then it is readily attacked by the nucleophile over here. So when the nucleophile attacks the carbocation over here, the, the carbon has a positive charge and you can say the nucleophile has a negative charge. So when it donates its extra electrons, that ele electron pair is shared. So this way, the final molecule is formed neutral. Now I'll teach you why SN1 substitution, it is a unimolecular reaction, which means it only takes one reactant. It's only dependent upon the upon one reactant, which is the haloalkane over here. So the effect of concentration or the amount of nucleophile you add in the reaction mixture, it does not matter. The rate equation, it's only dependent on one reactant over here. It has a slow step which is where this bond breaks down, which is where the carbon halogen bond breaks down. And then the nucleophilic attack is the fast step. Now I'll tell you why this mechanism happens only, or it is more, happens only with tertiary carbocations. Over here we see this carbocation, this one has a positive charge, and it has three alkyl groups attached to it. Okay, now this carbon, a, the alkyl groups, they have an inductive effect, which means that they push their electrons 
towards the carbon atom. So this positive charge present on the carbon, it is a little bit neutralized or it is not as strong. Versus if we compare to a secondary carbocation where two alkyl groups are donating their carbons. So the positive effect here is a little bit strong. And over here in the primary carbocation, the positive effect is even stronger, which means when the positive effect is very strong, this primary carbocation, it cannot just exist by itself. It will just react. And that's why this primary carbocation is quite unstable. Tertiary carbocation, however, the positive charge is a little bit neutralized. So this is a little bit stable over here. So the skin is exist on its own. That's why it has the ability to par participate in SN1 substitution, where this carbocation will form independently and then a nucleophile will come and attack it. Secondly, for SN2 substitution, we see that a nucleophile comes and it attacks the carbocation over here. Now, if there's a lot of steric hindrance, now what do I mean by steric hindrance? Steric hindrance is just the presence of other organic groups. Now, we have one more carbon. Now, let's imagine this in 3D. Hydrogen atoms are quite small compared to a heavy alkyl chain. So if there is less space, let's say co comparing to primary carbocation and tertiary carbocation. Here, carbon is surrounded with three large alkyl groups. Here, it's only one alkyl group over here and two small hydrogen atoms. So the nucleophile has space to attack over here and form an extra covalent bond. That's why primary carbocation usually participates in SN2 substitution. And since there's a lot of steric hindrance present in tertiary carbocations, it is kind of harder for the nucleophile to just attack because apart from three groups, there would also be the fourth linkage would be with the halogen. So it's a little bit hard for the nucleophile to attack. So the nucleophile has less space to attack and form a new covalent bond. That's why SN2 substitution is a little bit hard with a tertiary carbocation. We can explain this in very simple words. So over here, the nucleophile, it can just kick this atom. It can kick just the halogen from its base. This would be option number two, SN2 reaction. Or it can wait for this halogen to leave by itself and then it can come and take its place. So this would be SN1 or SN1 substitution. Since this breaking of the carbon halogen bond takes place on its own, so you could use the nucleophile over here. It doesn't have to be very strong. You could use a weak nucleophile, then you would still end up with SN1 substitution. However, you need a very strong nucleophile or a stronger nucleophile for SN2 substitution because this basically forms a new covalent bond over here and it induces the previous covalent bond to break down. So SN2 substitution requires a stronger nucleophile, whereas SN1 substitution, it can happen with a new weak nucleophile.